the intention of the healer to do good, to do well, to honor the life right in front of you. I mean, animals, mammals especially, but all animals, but like dairy cows, let's say, they'll look you right in the eye. A horse will too. A pig will too. And you connect eye to eye and heart to heart. If you can suspend your rational thought for the moment and just be with them and just enjoy and sense their being. You're listening to Down to Earth, the Planet to Plate podcast. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domondi, and that was Dr. Hubert Karaman, author, veterinarian, and farmer. We're going to be hearing a conversation I recorded with him right after these brief messages. This program is sponsored by the Agrarian Trust. Agrarian Trust is charting a new path forward for the land trust movement. They're advancing an innovative and robust model of land ownership in which agrarianism, social and environmental justice, community well-being, and the earth itself are all seen as fundamentally intertwined. They're doing this by helping regenerative farmers and ranchers to secure long-term affordable leases. That helps to strengthen local food systems and to transform community relationships to the land across the country. Visit agrariantrust.org to learn more. This program is sponsored by the Greenhorns. Listeners to Down to Earth might enjoy the newly released sixth edition of the New Farmer's Almanac, a literary miscellany written by and for working agrarians. This year's volume is titled Adjustments and Accommodations, and it's full of essays, poetry, and images that explore how people are facing challenges and uncertainties on the land. Learn more and order your copy at greenhorns.org. I'm very happy now to introduce Dr. Hubert Karaman. He is an author and a veterinarian. He and his wife run Reverence Farms, a diversified polyculture livestock and regenerative dairy farm. He will be speaking at the Regenerate Conference, which is November 1st through 3rd in Santa Fe. Welcome to Down to Earth. Well, thank you for having me. I, I look forward to talking together. Yeah, it's a, you have such an interesting story. I mean, first of all, tell us the story of how you got interested in dairy in the first place. You started in soil science, but soil science back in the day was a whole different thing. It wasn't even about the interaction with, with livestock. Yeah. <laughs> Well, true. I majored in soil science at the University of New Hampshire. And back in the day, soil science was really for what was then really conventional agriculture, as well as soil conservation service type things, not the soil biology and organic chemistry that's really uh, riding its due wave at this point. So I unfortunately, I missed out on the soil biology wave, but I did get into soils, and I'm a quintessential back-to-the-lander, if you will. I grew up outside of Philadelphia, so I, I was never on dairy farms until my third year in college as a soils major. I landed a uh, work-study job with the Soil Conservation Service locally in southeastern New Hampshire. And so every week I would go out and I'd be with the soil technician, and we would be surveying farmland, and it was mainly dairy farms back then. And all the time there were cows, and back in the day then, dairy cows really were out on the land a lot more than now. And so I was always kind of fascinated by them because my parents were both from Holland and, you know, they weren't farmers, but there was a lot of cheese and dairy products in our life growing up. So after college, I graduated in 1984, I pretty much apprenticed myself out to some dairy farmers over the next six years to learn about dairy cows because they were just fascinating. And I went and visited relatives over in the Netherlands. And one of my relatives found me a job on a dairy farm. And I was starting to milk Frisian cows there, as well as Sanan goats, the white goats. And I started milking and I was instantly addicted in a very, very good way. Ever since then, that'd be 1985, I've been in and around and working with and enjoying life with dairy cows. So what's really interesting is that, you know, I'm a veterinarian and I started in soil science and dairy cows, they really connect the two because, at least in my life, cows I know graze. And grazing 
obviously is taking what the earth gives and the soil that generates the grass for the cows to eat to uh, make the milk, which we then harvest every day. And then we have wonderful dairy products. And at one point, I started working on a biodynamic farm in 1988, and I had to work with medicines that I had no idea about. I was told right when I got there, you've got to use these homeopathic remedies, these botanical tinctures, these uh, colostrum whey products. And so I had only been using antibiotics and whatnot before that with the cows as a herdsman. But that farm, Seven Stars Farm, changed my life because I saw alternative medicines work and uh, I, I just felt this calling to go to veterinary school, and, and I did, and I got in. That's the amazing thing. And when I got out, I was using alternative medicines right along with some conventional medicines as needed for each case. So dairy cows are really an intersection for me, or a blending of soil science, where I started in ag, and veterinary medicine, which I still do to this day as a licensed veterinarian, but I also milk our own cows at our farm. When you first got out of vet school, were you being hired by um, other uh, dairy farmers to take care of their animals? Well, when I finished vet school at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, I had been on some ambulatory rotations as a veterinary student in the local farm area, because that's what the ambulatory clinic does. And Besides the many horses that they saw, they saw some farms, and I realized that, wow, you know, there's a lot of farms in Lancaster County, just half an hour from the veterinary school, large animal hospital, and I had already met some of the farmers out there when I was a herdsman at Seven Stars Farm, because it's in the neighboring county, and we, there'd be meetings by Dr. Ed Schaefer, who taught us all about homeopathy, and so when I got done veterinary school, I made myself available to those farmers and word got around very fast that there was a vet that was using things besides antibiotics and hormones for commonly encountered problems. And so my practice grew very fast, amazingly so, and that was 1995. And by 2015, when I, 20 years later, I had had 100 certified organic dairy farm clients, mainly Amish. And so I could really practice on individual cows because they're small farms, about 40 cows a farm. I, I loved it. I really gave it my heart. I loved it. I still do. <laughs> it's so interesting because, I mean, you've got this organic medicine and homeopathy, but then in veterinary school, not only are you not taught those things, but those things are kind of looked down on, but you put them together in a way that's interesting to me, I mean, do you use quote unquote conventional medicine too on animals or, or really are you only in the kind of organic and natural camp? No, I really do believe in integrative medicine and I will use whatever it takes for the best of the animal's life. When I looked at some of my veterinary records uh, about 15 years into it, I realized that in the preceding year, I had only used about mm, 20 or 25 actual dispensing prescription, if you will, of antibiotics. And it was mainly for young animals with pneumonia. Almost all the rest of my work, whether it was reproduction and fertility, or cows that were off feed, or that they had pink eye, or if they had ear problems or other general problems, uh, digestion, I used absolutely natural therapies but I have nothing against antibiotics whatsoever. They're just relied upon way too heavily in the conventional livestock sector. There's a lot of reasons for that, but antibiotics saved my life, that's for sure. So I have nothing against antibiotics, but I prefer to use homeopathics, botanicals, acupuncture, low-level laser therapy, hands-on healing, all those kind of modes of treatment whenever I can first. Now, I'm sure that there's some people who are listening right now who have ideas about homeopathy. I mean, I've heard a lot of people say that homeopathy is just the placebo effect, but the placebo effect isn't even a thing with animals. Yeah, it's really, it's 
really interesting. I have to go back and, and think about my initial uh, use of homeopathy at Seven Stars Farm. First of all, the placebo effect does not exist in animals. I think most every veterinarian can say without much hesitation, animals don't like to get treated. They just don't. Um, you know, getting poked and prodded and this and that. And so when you have a, like at Seven Stars, when I started using homeopathy, I, I saw it working so well that I would actually withhold treatment for maybe 12 hours or 24 hours and then institute treatment with homeopathics and biologics and and botanicals. In some cases that I knew that wouldn't get well, all of a sudden cleared up. And that can really be an eye-opener. And most veterinarians need just a few early successes to see that not everything needs an antibiotic or a hormone or steroid shot. Um, yeah. And, and what's really cool is that when I give the pellets of homeopathic remedies to the cows, I would stand right next to them. I'd put my arm, my left arm around their head. I'd open their mouth just slightly. I'd have the pellets in like the, a cap from the jar of remedies. I'd kind of quickly toss them into the mouth and then gently close their mouth and kind of just let their head rest upon me for, you know, 10, 15, 20 seconds so that the remedies could make contact with the mucous membranes of the gums. And then, you know, I'd let them go. And one, they would realize like I'm not harming them. You know, I'm not stuffing this huge pill down their throat. And two, what was even nicer is that with me holding them like that, there was a a shared sense of connection between me and them. So it, it kind of a little bonding. And I think that helps because the intention of the healer really counts with the patient. It really does. And, and so there's a lot of high-tech medicine these days, and it's great in specific cases, but there should always be the healing intention of the practitioner upon the patient. And, you know, people can sometimes say, well, that's part of the placebo effect or whatever, but it's, it's not because animals generally don't like to be treated except if they're treated kindly and then they respond well. Are you seeing more veterinarians opening up to this type of medicine as consumers become more aware of the the pitfalls and the problems of the overuse of antibiotics and resistant strains and things like that? I mean, do you is it becoming more common? Well, yes. And I assume that your question is the context is within large animal livestock practice and not small animal medicine, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, without doubt. Society wants less antibiotic use in in livestock. I think that's pretty clear. And regardless of what professional, you know, society you're in, what level government, what consumer bracket you're in, most people would prefer less antibiotics in the food chain, period, the end. And so to that end, actually, I'm trying to work within my professional association, the American Association of Bovine Practitioners, to advance the use of medicines, mainly botanicals and biologics, that were used prior to the advent of the antibiotic era. Because one, I think veterinarians would be open to that because that's what we would have been taught in 1937. And those kind of years what are some specific examples of those kinds of medicines that were taught, you know, a couple of generations ago? Well, let's say Cascara Sagrada for uh, digestive function, Aconitum napellus or Aconite for cardiovascular effects, Belladonna, Atropa Belladonna for cardiovascular effects and also for pupillary dilation. I mean, there were scores and scores and scores and scores of plants, uh, plant-derived medicines that were kind of laid aside, even though they were in common clinical use, but they were laid aside pretty much post-World War II with the advent of the synthetic pharmaceutical era. And, you know, there were some real wonder drugs that came out of the early pharmaceutical era and still are, but there was, at that stage, like when penicillin was discovered, it was an amazing discovery, a miraculous cure. So, you know, it kind of lived 
within the existing paradigm of, at that time, still plant-derived medicines and biologics. But then it was so amazing that all the focus was on that and everything else therefrom over the last bunch of decades. But there's no reason not to look at what veterinarians and human doctors were using prior to the antibiotic era if we want to reduce antibiotic use in livestock. And not just look back, but also look at what the current research is, and it's usually in other countries, on plant medicines and, and the biochemistry and the physiological effects of those drugs or products that come out of that. Very interesting. I mean, as you're talking, I can't help thinking about whether there is a kind of a parallel between the way veterinary medicine for livestock has evolved, well, veterinary medicine in general, medicine in general, has evolved, and how agriculture has evolved. I mean, both have become more kind of chemical and industrial dependent, and now a lot of people are going back to a more natural medicine and a more natural farming. All true. Veterinary science and veterinary medicine really did march lockstep hand in hand with agribusiness. And, you know, who knows who discovered or realized or observed that when you fed antibiotics to poultry or pigs or cattle, you could house more of them in the same space than you could previously. And so then there was the intensification of livestock because, well, you could put antibiotic in the feed and, and, and kind of cover over some conditions that might have arisen otherwise with so many animals in one area. You know, essentially they're crutches for production. And, you know, it's really interesting because when BST or uh, Pozolac or uh, bovine growth hormone, you know, is out, I know that just thinking about it, you know, a dairy farmer that would have a 20,000 pound a year average on his cows uh, each cow that was using that. And if I think about, you know, a neighbor down the road, let's say that had a 20,000 pound cow average that wasn't using it. In a certain sense, I know who the better farmer is because they're getting the same production without the crutch. It's interesting to see how we've come uh, to the point of like where society is now saying, and that through legislation and, and the government, and actually a lot of antimicrobial resistance, which is a real issue, you know, like they're saying, hey, you know, let's put the brakes on some of these practices and let's applaud and support a more natural approach, a more regenerative approach, a more um, grass fed approach. And what's interesting is that I, I'd say the government is not doing that, but the consumers are and they're voting with their wallets and pocketbooks and it's making a difference. I mean, the organic industry or the organic sphere sector, whatever you want to call it, uh, whether it's produce or livestock is booming. And that's due to consumer demand for less antibiotics. You're listening to Down to Earth. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. The National Young Farmers Coalition, a longtime partner of the Kivira Coalition, works to shift power and change policy to equitably resource our new generation of working farmers. You can connect with them at the Regenerate Conference, November 1st through 3rd, and learn about the legislation they're championing to address land access and the climate crisis. More information at youngfarmers.org. This year's Regenerate Conference is coming up quickly. It'll be held in Santa Fe, New Mexico, November 1st through 3rd, and it's an exploration of regenerative agriculture at every scale, from microbial soil communities to social relationships and markets to changing climate and everything in between. Come and learn how people from all walks of life are innovating on the land, in the markets, and with their communities to bring greater diversity and resilience to this movement. There are many free educational and social offerings that are open to the public on the pre-conference day, November 1st. Check out the website for more information, regenerateconference.com. And now back to our program. Talk about your dairy farming practices. You're doing things differently from the way industrial dairies do them in a number of ways, including keeping the calves with the cows for a considerable amount of time after they're born. Yeah, we're we're practicing a kind of dairy farming that, in a sense, is as old as 
cows and man together, but in a sense is really cutting edge compared to the traditional sector. And I don't always like to say like animal industry. I just, that, that those two terms just don't, I don't like to put them together. So I'll just say animal sector, animal sphere. Right. We, generally speaking, I mean, in a traditional dairy farm, you know, calves are born, they are reared separately as a group or individually, and the mom's milk all goes to the milk tank to go to the truck to make the yogurt, the ice cream, the butter, whatever it is at the dairy plant. And, you know, the dairy farmer's income is from the milk in the tank. That's really the basic bottom line and economic model. However, just like organic and regenerative is really coming into its own now, there's even a leading edge of that that is saying, you know what? Consumers, really aware consumers, are becoming more sensitive to the fact that dairy calves are essentially separated, removed, taken away from their moms pretty much right at birth for the reasons I just stated, you know, to put milk in the tank. And there, there's some now demand for a more, I don't know, kinder, gentler method of rearing calves, and that's on their moms. And so we do that. We leave the moms and the calves together. We milk once a day, and the calves are with their moms 24-7 for the first three weeks. And then after that, when the calves start taking a lot of milk from the udder because they're growing rapidly and they love that milk, then we do separate them overnight so that when we milk in the morning, there's milk in the udder for the tank. And then we reunite them after milking time at you know late morning until early evening. And then so then they go to overnight camp again, the calves, until the morning. And it's really wonderful to see the interaction between the mom and the calf. It's amazing how maternal, it's just, it's beautiful. It's really, a, I could show so many pictures and videos of calves with their cows. And also the other thing is that we graze. I mean, that's just part of what I do since Seven Stars Farm way back in 1988. We graze and we do management intensive grazing, move the cows every two to three times a day. And the calves that are with their moms learn how to graze. And it's great because then they become better grazers because of the learned behavior and they learn what they can eat, what they can't eat. And there's a whole science to that by a friend of mine, Dr. Fred Provenza, who was at Utah State. He studied lambs and sheep behavior quite a lot and uh, how certain biochemicals are triggered and positive digestive processes to eat more of a certain thing or a negative feedback loop so they avoid other things all by watching their moms eat. So, you know, aside from that, as well as the calves need less intensive labor by people because they're kind of being taken care of by their moms, it's just really a wonderful thing to see as well. It really, it's heartwarming seeing the interactions. Now, when people say to you, you're losing money by doing that, do you feel that that's true or is that just part of humane treatment of animals or how do you think about that? Well, it's, uh, I don't know if we're losing money doing it, to be honest. I mean, I'm not an economist at all, but it costs X amount of dollars per day and raising them individually, let's say in hutches or however you want to do it for the labor to feed them the milk or to mix the milk up if it's from a powder or the real thing to bed them to, uh, you know, just take care of them is, is a professional job really. And so while it does take labor to unite and separate the calves and the cows that's about it so as far as like less milk in the tank because of that you're still going to have to feed the calves whether you do it from bought supplies or you do it from taking maybe not the greatest quality milk out of the tank or having a separate tank for not great quality milk and feeding that to the calves either way you got to feed the calves and so why not take a step out of it you know, with all the labor to wash the calf bottles and the nipples and, and mixing the milk formula, if you're doing that. A big thing in the uh, conventional world is to withhold forage from a calf and feed them only milk and grain until they're weaned at about two months old. We say, let them eat what their moms eat, which is forage, the grasses and whatnot, so that their rumen develops as quickly as possible. 
And uh, we've seen calves chewing their cud, which is a benchmark uh, sign of health for ruminants. We've seen calves chewing their cud at, at 10 to 14 days of age. So that's proof positive that the rumen is developing quickly and they're being raised in a natural way. I mean, think of this. Animals, domesticated animals, I don't care if it's a cat, a dog, a cow, a sheep, a horse, a pig. If they are fed more like what their wild cousins would eat out in the wild, well, they're going to be in better health digestively as well as, you know, and everything comes from digestion and good digestive health. So we believe that calves learning how to eat grass and hay at an early as age as possible is good for good reasons. Yeah, I, I just want to let our listeners know that if you want to hear, we did a, a show with Fred Provenza a few years ago, and you can find it where you find this podcast. And he's he's wonderful. And I wanted to ask you, I mean, do you find that your cows need less veterinary medicine because of the way you're handling them? Well, it's interesting. I'd say in general, in general, yes. And I'd say that I know from practice, being in, uh, in the trenches 20 years in Lancaster, PA area, and earlier on from 1995, in the first five years or so, there were obviously more conventional farms I was working with as, the, as they were transitioning to organic. Once the guys transitioned to organic, they tended to find that after about a year of being certified organic, their vet bill went down. You know, was it due to the cows grazing? Possibly. Was it due to them not feeding as rich an, a diet because it cost a lot, let's say, to buy organic grains? Possibly. Was it due to other preventative type practices? Possibly. But in general, when cows are allowed to graze, let that fresh air, sunshine, clean water, dry bedding, you know, that's your best vaccination program there is and your best preventative health program there is. And it's just basic husbandry. And so on farms that keep the cows in all the time on concrete and they go between the bunk and their stalls and the milking parlor and, you know, basically that's the whole cycle. You know, they might get more lameness because of where they stand on the concrete, which puts pressure on the feet. And it depends how their hoof health is. Not that we don't get hoof problems, but it's usually from the cows walking in the lanes, maybe stepping on a stone or a stick and and causing a problem like that, which is more sporadic than endemic. When I was in practice early on and when I was with a vet clinic early on before I went solo and really focused on organic only, I did a lot of surgeries that are for twisted stomachs. It's called displaced abomasums, and that's from cows being fed a lot of high starch, high energy diets to make a lot of milk. And then it kind of balloons in their fourth stomach, the abomasum, and that floats up out of place. And then you have to do surgery to tack it down to the bottom of the belly. And there's a lot more of that on cows that are kept inside and not grazing. I have to say, listening to you, it seems to me that we make things more complicated than we need to be. I mean, the idea of taking a calf away from its milk-producing mother and giving it powdered milk and not letting it bond with and learn from its mother. I mean, to somebody, I've never milked a cow in my life, but I mean, it seems insane. It seems like going back to a natural way of life, it makes so much more sense. Well, I, 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 I'm going to agree with you. Um <laughs> You got to remember, like you and I both didn't grow up on farms. I didn't know what was involved with milk production. There are economics involved. And, you know, when you're dairy farming, you're farming for money, not with money. Although you might start with money, you still have to farm for money at some point. Whereas like with horses, you're almost always farming with money. And so there are a lot of reasons that dairies have become extremely large you know, one term would be economies of scale, that they can buy things in that they need at a lower cost per unit than a small farm. And I think it was said that, you know, dairy farming, at least back in the 60s, I think Kennedy said this, is the only business where you buy in retail and you sell wholesale, which is true. And so over time, 
people got smart that you could actually keep more cows inside and intensify everything and get cheaper inputs to a level than you could if you were small and extensive and grazing your cows. But uh, yeah, I mean, when people look into livestock agriculture, unfortunately, we've come to a point where, and it's been going on for a while now, where you have concentrated animal feed operations or CAFOs, they're called CAFOs. You have that for the intensification endpoint. And then you also have kind of a consumer backlash against that where some consumers just opt out and then become vegans. And, you know, I could never be a vegan, but, you know, I I, I understand vegetarianism where people are like, well, yeah, I don't want to buy into that system that I've been seeing the way it is. And so I wish that more people that are kind of sitting on the fence and going, huh, do I really want to eat or, or drink milk or eat cheese or, or beef or anything like that? If they're sitting on the fence... I would hope that they see or can be shown that regenerative grazing organic farms that are small or even medium size, medium size these days could be like five, 600 head, whatever, are really good for the land. And, you know, that connection between the animal and the land and the people taking care of the animals, walking them back and forth to pasture, there's a lot to be said for that, and people resonate with that. Consumers resonate with that, or at least a section of consumers do. And um, they're willing to pay the premium for that food. One quick thing, what's really interesting is that if you ask me, organic food actually reflects the true cost of production because there's no hidden costs involved. So there's no pollution of the underground aquifers, you know, that there can be in conventional large farming with a lot of chemicals. And so once a consumer pays what they do at the cash register for grass-fed, certified organic, regenerative, you name it, animal welfare approved products, that product is paid for. There's no hidden cost to society later where there certainly can be with the heavily subsidized corn and soybean type industries that are going, and in that sense, I do use the word industry, that are just glazing the landscape with fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, whatever's needed, and that killing the soil organisms, as well as seeping into the groundwater, there's no way to really clean that up except to stop doing it. And some farmers, I don't know how they're showing the light, if you will, you know, realize like, hey, there's a different way and I'm going to try it. And so, yeah, natural farming systems do just make sense. But there's so much agribusiness and agri-science and government subsidies that's built up what we have now in the United States that it's hard to believe that there's anything but that. But yeah, natural farming and animal husbandry are the building blocks of agriculture in society <laughs> for thousands of years. Well, and it seems like, I mean, and this is something we've talked about many times on this program, when you have an extractive industry, eventually, whatever it is that you're extracting runs out, it's literally unsustainable. And so at a certain point, I don't know when that will be, but it seems like we're going to have no choice but to return to some kind of regenerative set of practices. Absolutely, 100% agree. And you're going to hit the wall where you can't extract anymore and then you move on. You, you just do. Now, I will say that in the certified organic realm in dairy, there are larger farms that have to meet the 30% dry matter intake rule. What's that? Well, that that's a rule actually was part of uh, on the National Organic Standards Board that certified organic ruminants beef cattle, dairy, whatever, need to consume at least 30% of their dry matter intake via grazing in a year's time. And it's actually not that much when you look at it over a year. So in other words, it, it ensures the organic consumer who's paying the premium that cows are outside grazing. If you can do it, great. I mean, there's some small farms that don't graze at all. 
and there's some larger organic farms that do graze, and that's legally allowed. But what's interesting is over in the Netherlands, grazing is such an interesting thing because people want to see cows on the land. And so that's part of the reason why the certified organic rule exists for the consumers is to ensure them that cows are out and about, feet touching the land, grazing. In the Netherlands, there's actually a premium for farmers to graze their cows as well because tourists going through the country like to see the Dutch dairy cows outside. So grazing is good because it provides fresh feed to the animal, to the digestive system, and it's good for the customer and people that drive through the landscape because it gives them, you know, it's interesting. Dairy cows kind of give you a sense of home in a certain sense because they go out, they graze for a certain amount of the day and they come back home and it's milking time. And people can identify with that as they go to work, you know, they go out and they do their work and they go back home. And so when they are driving through the landscape and they see dairy cows grazing, there's something about that that resonates with people without doubt. What happens to the milk from your cows? Do you make any dairy products on farm or or where does it go? Our milk goes to a local creamery, Chapel Hill Creamery, and cheese is made from that. And it's a very small cheese maker. They had their own cows, maybe 35 cows. I think they have maybe 15 now. We have about 60 and we're going up to 75 soon. And our milk goes there. It's about 15 minutes away. And we have a little licensed legal milk tank that we haul over there twice a week when cheese is made. You live in North Carolina in an area where there were once a lot more dairy farms. Now you're one of the few. What happened? (laughs) You know, I was just talking with Suzanne, my wife, about this this morning. I don't know what happened exactly, to be honest, okay? But it's kind of interesting. There's so many PhDs being done on agricultural, this and that, uh, you name it. I mean, there's a lot of intensive research on how to make dairy products, how to make better bugs in the soil for the roots of the plants. Probably a PhD could be done on why there was a demise of the dairy industry and all the factors that led to it. But yeah, there used to be a hundred farms in this one county where we live, and now there's two, us and one other one. The other one markets their own milk. They pasteurize it and they have a little on-farm processing plant and they market it. And he does really well. He's a, he's a wonderful guy. And we're the other one. And it's just strange how when dairy farms have basically followed what the extension service has said for so many years, which is basically an outlet for what the research is from the land-grant universities. They've done it. Farmers have done it. They've gone to the meetings, and then they basically, in the end, got shafted because farms were just getting bigger. So even if they were doing exactly what the Extension Service said, let's say in this region, it didn't matter, in a sense, unless they got bigger. You know, it's the old get bigger or get out type paradigm. And it's unfortunate, but it's true in livestock agriculture, unless you're a direct marketer of some sort or a niche type label, and then you can stay nice and small. And fortunately, there's more and more consumers wanting that. Are you suggesting that the advice they got from the extension services of the land grant universities was at that time not good advice? Nope, I'm not saying that. It was not faulty advice. It was the research coming out of the universities. What's interesting is a lot of the research for, let's say, dairy cow problems like milk fever, which is low blood calcium when they calve and they're they're flat out and they need IV calcium. The kind of research that discovered that and learned how to, uh, in veterinary medicine, then learned how to treat it, you know, back in the 50s and 60s was, you know, all publicly funded for the most part because it was like discovery and and how can we like eradicate certain diseases that were just rampant. But then at a certain point, probably around the 80s, I would guess when livestock intensification happened at the university level, they were getting research money, not from the public government as much, although they still did, but from private companies, whether it's 
an agrochemical company or a pharmaceutical company. And so then the research kind of started getting into comparing products that these companies made to basic husbandry practices and showing the benefits of these products. And that's what the extension service would use, you know, with their megaphone approach that they have. Nothing wrong with extension per se. It's just that the information going into it can be skewed due to the funding sources. I'll just put it that way. And that's the same for actually veterinary schools and, you know, products that are being tried in veterinary hospitals at the schools are basically nice outlets for pharmaceutical companies to test out new drugs that they want to market. Simple as that, really. Right. And the same thing happens in human medicine. And there's been several documentaries about the opioid crisis, but that's a whole other topic. But yeah, I mean, it's the, in a sense, you're talking about the corruption of these systems by big money. Yeah. However you want to term it, that's, yeah. Yeah. You know, the the utilization might be one way to look at it or the corruption, another way to look at it. But either way, it's the funding sources that have been self-serving and yet it's given kind of a, a wink, you know, like this is the better way. And a lot of farmers that I've known in the organic world are just like, screw this. Like I've been like, like sold a bill of goods. I'm, I'm out of here, man. I'm not doing a thing what, you know, the conventional sector is going to tell me to do anymore. And it's really true. Some farmers are like that. And so even a veterinarian like me, that's pretty open-minded and using natural treatments, I'm a veterinarian, so I'm guilty as charged by a farmer like that. And I understand that. But then again, you know, you have to think about the individual animal. You know, what does it need at that moment? You know, what can I do to help it? And I'm sorry if I'm also trained in veterinary medicine, Mr. Farmer, Miss Farmer. And I, you've had, you know, a bad run in with a vet. But like, give me a chance. I mean, I'm just trying to help your animal. Right. Well, and yeah, and so we're talking about using the best of both worlds. And I mean, one of the things that I'm noticing from talking to you and and the conversation we had the other day is that what you're doing and the way you're thinking about it, both as a dairy farmer and as a veterinarian and as a person living in community, that it's so much about connection and relationship. And yes, you're doing science-based practices and evidence-based practices, whatever you want to call it. But there's also this dimension that is based in a deep love, love for nature. I mean, your farm is called Reverence Farms. Talk more about that piece of it, the sort of connection and reverence piece for you. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, I can, anybody can really go down the whole litany of what we just talked about and all the funding sources and all that. And that doesn't touch upon real life. I mentioned earlier just that, you know, seeing the animals grazing resonates with people. And when you have all our cows at our farm, Reverence Farms, have names right when they're born. They're given a name by somebody come, who comes up with a name for the calf. Usually first letter is the same first letter as the mom. So it just helps things out. And I mentioned earlier as well, when, I, when I'd when i give homeopathic remedies at Seven Stars Farm when I started, I would hold the cow's head and I would just pop the pellets in her mouth and just hold her mouth closed and gently kind of just be with her. You know, when we were talking about the placebo effect and, and the intention of the healer. And the intention of the healer to do good, to do well, to honor the life right in front of you. I mean, animals, mammals especially, but all animals, but like dairy cows, let's say, they'll look you right in the eye. A horse will too. A pig will too. And you connect eye to eye and heart to heart. If you can suspend your rational thought for the moment and just be with them and just enjoy and sense their being and their being alive. And they're another kind of life, but they're no better or no worse than we are. Their life just like we are. 
And I'm not saying we're all equal, but the trans species connection, like even seeing like cows just sniffing around like chickens that might be around or pigs or whatever, just just the uh, connection and the, the relationship building that is possible and carried through with the animals in our midst is a wonderful thing. And it really transcends all the science and all the economics and all the gritty, natural, hard realities that are out there. And it transcends it to a point where you can really see the farm as its own unique entity, its own organism, its contained life that when the animals are out walking on the land, you know, their kinetic action on the land is energizing what they're walking on when they pull up the grass by munching it and however they graze, goats and sheep graze differently from each other than they do from cows and horses, but they're pulling up the grass from the roots and it kind of invigorates the grass to regrow. And watching that with our eyes and, you know, sniffing clean, fresh cut hay and just listening also to cows and any animal grazing, there's something that is indescribable and that's life. I mean, life is beyond the material right in front of ourselves and we have to see the spiritual side of the animals as well. I don't know how else to put it. I'll say that when I lay hands on cows, and I've been trained in Reiki, but I don't understand all those symbols they use in Reiki, and it didn't really resonate with me. And one thing I do tell people when I'm teaching alternative medicine is if one mode of alternative medicine does not resonate with you, don't go there. Use something that does resonate. And so even though I was trained in Reiki, what I really found was that when I lay hands on animals, just I feel this vibration in my hands and the animal feels that. And all of a sudden, a cow that wasn't chewing cud will burp up a cud and start chewing. A horse will drop its head a little and its lips will loosen up. And that kind of connection counts. It's just really enhancing of life. And so, yeah, Reverence Farms is... Uh, all about enhancing others' lives, not just our own. And it seems like seeing ourselves in the animals around us and in all the life around us and, you know, they're seeing it in us, it makes it so much harder to commit acts of cruelty to animals or the land. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Absolutely. I, having a reverence for life is one of our highest callings. And to do less than that is an abomination and not the way creation was created to be. I'll leave it at that. I mean, we're supposed to take care and steward what's been given to us by using what's now called regenerative methods or if you want to call real traditional methods, is really where it's at. And the regenerative wave that's going on now is wonderful because it does draw on traditional concepts of agriculture and weaves in new science that backs up the traditional ways of farming and enhances that. And that's all good. So what will you be talking about at the Regenerate Conference? Well, it's going to be basically a virtual farm tour. You know, everyone's so used to virtual Zoom meetings these days and everything. Well, I'm going to give a tour of our diversified dairy farm, the different species we have here besides dairy cows, our practices in uh, grazing and silvo pasture, pigs being raised in the woods, egg mobiles and the chickens. And I'm also going to be definitely talking about like some of the challenges we've either faced initially with doing some things or that have arisen and how we dealt with them so that new agrarians will not stumble as much as perhaps we have. Dr. Hubert Karaman is an author and veterinarian, 
he and his wife run Reverence Farms. I want to thank you so much for being with us here on Down to Earth. My pleasure, and I look forward to being in Santa Fe. To find out more, you can go to drcaramans.com, D-R-K-A-R-R-E-M-A-N-S.com, and to reverencefarms.com, and you can find all of that in our show notes at downtoearthradio.com or on the Kivira Coalition website. You've been listening to Down to Earth. We would love it if you would support this program, which you can do by going to patreon.com slash downtoearthplanettoplate, where you can sign up for as little as $3. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And also please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The Kivira Coalition is a not-for-profit and a community network of ranchers, farmers, conservationists, scientists, educators, and many others dedicated to regenerative practices that produce healthy food, support meaningful livelihoods, sustain biodiversity, and remedy the impacts of climate change. To learn more about Kivira and how you can support their work, visit kiviracoalition.org, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. And finally, this show is a production with the Radio Cafe. You can check out radiocafe.org to hear back episodes of this show and also find all kinds of other shows on a wide variety of topics as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.